Uh, before Doc joins us, I think it's only respectful to remind everyone at home why we love him so damn much. Enjoy. Stanley Cup playoffs, seventh game. This is where it ends tonight. Right back ahead comes Seabrook with a shot. He's got of adrenaline. Fifteen years at NBC, twenty-one years working with the New Jersey Devils. He's called twenty-two Stanley Cups, Timmy. He's won eight Emmy Awards. He was inducted into the broadcasting wing of the Hockey Hall of Fame in 2008. And he is such a big time guest. We bumped Brian Burke to have him on today. <laughs> Doc, oh my Emer- goodness, Doc! Oh. This it's a big day. Welcome to the show. Oh, Great to have you. oh that is frightening. You bumped Berkey. Do you He's- realize that he sat across from me on the bus on fourteen hour rides to Halifax from Portland for one year? <laughs> so we heard. So we heard. He's going to yeah. be the mood. He's coming on the show tomorrow, Doc. He's going to be pissed. He's not going to oh, be. Happy. I know he is. <laughs> Doc, this is way easier I don't because. Know if it... Go ahead. I was going to say, this is way easier because we're working from our basement, so we don't have to see him. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> you can't oh, punch uh, us in the face. Quick, quick story you can remind him of tomorrow, unless it's, unless it's in his book, because uh, our books came out the same day. Uh, he, he was, uh, he's in my book because of, uh, how colorful he was. And he was a part of a cha- Calder cup championship team. The first year that the Maine Mariners were, ex- were in existence, but the second year he went off to law school in Boston and his old buddies, the Mariners were playing a game in Springfield. And I was the broadcaster, and so he drove down to Springfield to pay a visit to his to his friends and to watch the game. And when I knew he was there, he was loved in Portland. So I said, would you mind putting on the headsets and commenting on the game tonight? People in Portland would love to hear you. So he said, yeah, sure. So this was the 1970s. It was the 78-79 season, and... Uh, those of you who are listening who are younger than 40 um, won't know this unless you know your history, that it was allowed to empty the benches without a lot of suspensions back in that time, <laughs> and everybody could fight everybody else. Well, anyway, the game between Maine and Springfield um, got rougher as the evening went on, and we're into the second period, and the layout of the Big E Coliseum in Springfield was that the team benches were side by side, but not that close. But behind the benches were, of course, a a tall pane of glass, but also three rows of seats, uh, individual chairs, etc. So there was a disturbance going on in the second period that involved some of the main (laughs) players and some of the Springfield fans. And the last thing that listeners to my broadcast heard uh, coming from Brian Burke was... Doc, I'm sorry. I got to go. The boys need me down there. (laughs) And I thought that his days of throwing roundhouse rights ended when he took (laughs) off the orange jersey the year before, but I was wrong. So, so Doc, basically, you you watched the movie Slapshot and said, yeah, I've seen that. Like, it was real, too. (laughs) Yeah. 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 yeah, you're absolutely right. Those were those were wonderful times, and those are all part of things that you look back on when you realize that 47 years of broadcasting have passed, and you've known an awful lot of people, including Brian Burke, that are friends to this day and will continue to be that. So it's good that you're in your basement, <laughs> and I didn't realize that uh, he had been bumped for me. <laughs> well, as long as he didn't take off a shoe, we're all good. Um, yeah, okay. Doc, Doc Emmerich joining us here on, on Tim and Sid. Listen, I have family in Indiana. Uh, they're a little northeast of LaFontaine, Indiana. They're in Angola. And my dad, cool. pl- 
Angola, Indiana, by the way. Uh, yeah, my, my dad, almost Michigan. Yep, right, right by cold water. Uh, my dad played for the Indianapolis Chiefs in 1959-60, so I kind of oh know. Th- I know the area. Hockey's there, but it's not basketball. It's not football. <laughs> no. How did you end up in hockey? And Sid and I love you because we can feel your passion for the game. Where, where did you get the passion? It all came from seeing a game live, which is the real value of, of college teams, junior teams all across North America, minor league teams, as they introduce people like myself to the sport live for the first time. We take a lot of pride in how we televise the sport. But there's nothing like seeing a game live to get you hooked. That occurred 60 years ago in December for me, and it was in Fort Wayne. Uh, the Comets still yeah. exist in Fort Wayne, Indiana, the same orange and black uniforms. Uh, that I saw back then in 1960, and that got me hooked. And I went into the Coliseum that night wanting to be a baseball announcer, and I came out, I wanted to be a hockey announcer in the worst way. I was 14 years old. And the question is, how does a guy from rural Indiana ever become a hockey announcer, professional announcer? Well, not simple, but uh, but I've, I've been very lucky to have people along the way that have helped me and and listen to my work and help me get better and help me get jobs that advance me forward. So that's how it all happened. I was uh, I was one of 8032 that got to see the Fort Wayne Comets every Saturday night. It was popular in Fort Wayne and they sold out all the time and your dad played for the Chiefs yep. and those were about the only two ice rinks in the state of Indiana in 1960, <laughs> Fort Wayne and Indianapolis. Yeah, he played at the state fair. I, I remember. I remember the story. Yeah. He played at the state fair, and one time he saw Oscar Robertson walking around. So he was. That's his big story. Yeah, he played for Crispus Attucks, the back-to-back yeah. state champions in the mid 1950s. Oscar was a hero in that state. In our little town of 600, the only celebrities in town were the 12 members of the varsity team and the coach. 13 <laughs> celebrities in town. Awesome. It was just like the movie Hoosiers. We had a little gym that had a stage at one end, and the band sat on the stage. And at the other end, there was a trophy case not far away from the from the wall at the other end. It was it was very much like that. But uh, that was that was life in the 50s. Tim, I don't want to ruin this conversation. If you want to continue, go ahead. I feel like I'm, I feel like <laughs> okay. I'm third wheel here. This is great. I'm just I'm listening I, like a fan here. This is fantastic. But I feel like this sets up the book, too, because how a kid from basketball crazy Indiana became America's NHL voice, uh, by the way, with our forward, uh, with the foreword from our friend Eddie Olchuk. Um, when, when you started, did you think it would be five decades of this? Like, it's amazing. No, I thought I was going to be in the in the minors trying to hold on to a job every year for, I don't know, 35, 40 years if I could make it last that long. I was just so happy to be a professional hockey announcer in Port Huron, Michigan, that I was just glad from year to year. Our team was owned by the city of Port Huron. Uh, it was given to them by, there was a famous announcer in the United States named Harry Wismer, who had a lot of the national... Uh, broadcast. His brother, John, owned the team in Port Huron and owned the radio station that carried the games. And he gave the team to the city of Port Huron for a dollar. And unfortunately, it became a political football every year because the team lost money. Uh, Battleship Kelly played for the Port Huron Flags. Frank St. Marseille played for the Port Huron Flags. A lot of guys came from there and wound up going to the NHL. But anyway, it was uh, every year was a question about whether they'd be back because the city had to approve them operating. So I was there for four years and each summer there was a question about whether I'd be back or not. But fortunately the flyers won a couple of Stanley cup championships. They were dissatisfied with the fact that they had to share a working agreement in Springfield for their players, John Paddock and Al Hill and people like that. Were, were guys that they had felt had a future, but they had to share playing time, and they wanted to control that. So they created their own farm team in Portland, Maine, called the Mariners, and they made sure that they stocked the team well, and that meant two lines of scorers and two lines of tough guys. Brian Burke was one of the tough guys. And, yeah, we emptied the benches a lot, and I saw him <laughs> throw them quite a few times too. 
Uh, and we had the same sort of uh, group on defense, but Pete Peters was the heroic goaltender for both of the first two championships. And Pete had quite a time in the NHL as well. So that was the success that I wound up having when I got the job in Maine and then the Flyers promote from within. And uh, that was my entree into the NHL 40 years ago. Hall of Fame broadcaster Doc Emmerich, who announced his retirement just uh, this week here on Tim and Sid. We're just reminiscing. This is as enjoyable a segment as I've had in a long time. This is fantastic <laughs> having you on, Doc. Oh, Doc, thank you. I, 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 oh, go ahead. Go ahead. No, no, no. You, you go right ahead. I have a, I have a, forgive me if it's widely known in the hockey broadcasting world, the question I'm going to ask you. And I apologize ahead of time if it's, if it's a widely known thing. Were you ever given the opportunity to work in, in Canada over an extended period of time? Did that ever come up? No, no, no. Uh, I, I, and I was never offended by the fact that that never happened. No, I will tell you this, though. Two guys, Ralph Mellenby and John Shannon, uh, were involved in inviting me in probably 1981 or 82 to produce features that were shown on Hockey Night in Canada. And I thought this is the greatest compliment that any guy in my position can ever get. And so there were there were features that were shown on Hockey Night that were done uh, when I was working in Philadelphia for the Flyers. Uh, they were shown on on local cable in Philadelphia and also um, at the um, at the behest of Ralph Mellenby uh, at Hockey Night in Canada. So that was as good a compliment as I could get, because that was a premier television package in Canada and still is. Doc Emmerich joining us here on Tim and Sid. And, and Doc, uh, you might not know us, but our audience knows we're sports nerds. We watch everything. Uh, we still really enjoy it, even though we're we're pushing 45 and beyond. But <laughs> 45. Not, not all of us, Doc. Not all of us. Gosh <laughs> almighty, they may shoot you next spring. Huh? <laughs> um, but your passion is infectious. And even though you're American, uh, I think your you're nearly five decades in hockey have made you an honorary Canadian with a U. Honorary with a U, uh, Doc Emmerich joining us here. I know it's like asking your favorite child, but but now that you've been able to look back, what games stick out to you the most? Well, um, probably the first of the national network games that I did that stand out to me was the 87 final game seven between Philadelphia and Edmonton because I've been asked what the best team was that I ever saw. And I, I took it down to three, but the, the best team that I ever saw was the 87 Oilers because of all the hall of famers that were on that. And they were still very young at the time. Uh, they were in their early or mid twenties, or maybe a couple of them have crept across 25 and, and they were going to go on and earn more accolades. But, um, they were up against a Philadelphia team that was coached by Mike Keenan that had a lot of grit and they, they fell short against the Oilers in 85, but they somehow or other pushed it to a seventh game. And actually they scored first in Edmonton, Murray Craven scored from behind the goal line. And then eventually the Oilers came back and, and Ron Hextall got the, the con Smythe in his rookie year for being the spectacular goaltender that did get to, into a bit of trouble uh, and got suspended the next fall for something that he did yeah. in the, in the uh, playoffs well, that year. These things happen, it's Doc. You know that. These, right things, away. These, these things happen back in the day. You know that. Yeah. <laughs> they did indeed. Why do I have a smile on my face? <laughs> they did indeed. We all do. Um, but that, that was – I was getting to see one of the great teams that I would ever see, and, and here I was – only in the NHL for seven years. And I got to do on ESPN the seventh game of the final. And it was between Philly and Edmonton. And um, where are we on time? You have commercials to get to, we got right? About, we got, <laughs> unfortunately, we, you know, we're, we don't, we do not have enough time. We got six minutes. Sorry, doc, but you, you take it wherever you want to take it. Go ahead. You've been kind enough. Oh, with okay. So th this just shows you what the, the, uh, the final was like in those days, because now, the Stanley Cup is under the control of the Hockey Hall of Fame, and it is watched over with guys with white gloves, and it's in a box. So uh, Mike Keenan 
gets the Stanley Cup brought into the Flyers dressing room before the sixth game. This is what you're playing for, guys. Can you imagine that now? That the cup would be brought in? And so uh, I figured the statute of limitations had had run out (laughs) when I saw Glenn Sather, who was at, at, at that time coach and general manager of the Edmonton Oilers, because the rumor was on the day of Game 7 that he had gotten the Stanley Cup and made sure uh, in a most secure way that it was not going to be absconded and brought into the Flyers' dressing room before Game 7. So I saw him this past season after a game at Madison Square Garden, and I said, I've got a question for you. Is it true that in your vehicle, in the parking lot, in Edmonton, during the afternoon of Game 7, that you actually had the Stanley Cup, and he laughed, <laughs> which was not a demi- denial, and it wasn't an affirmation, but he laughed. So I suppose I'll try to ask for a yes or no some other time. <laughs> yeah, that's, that seems like that's a good... what it was like back then. No doubt. No doubt. Shout out to Dave Poole and Mark. Howe. What a team that was. That's one yeah. of the best teams I've ever oh, seen in my life. Not win the yeah. cup. One of the best teams ever to not win the cup. One of the best playoff series I ever saw in my life. Sorry. We only got three minutes. Doc Emmerich, the legendary Doc Emmerich joining us. Doc, before we let you go, there's a, I'm sure there's some aspiring um, broadcasters, uh, men and women, young men and women who, who want to do play by play one day. If you could offer them a piece of advice, what would it be? Don't quit. Because I, I have a three-ring binder here back in the archaic times. You sent um, cassettes or tapes in the mail with, with applications and, and resumes, and then you got a rejection letter back. And the stack that I got is probably an inch and a half thick with lots of famous signatures on them because people sent mail to you back then rather than email. Mm-hmm. But don't quit. And, and uh, repetition of doing things over and over helps. Even if it's just into a recorder and you do it to yourself and you put it aside and then after you've forgotten what happened in the game, listen to it again and evaluate whether you can tell where the puck is and who has it and which team it is. And I will share with you, if it winds up being someone who gets in touch with you, I will share with you after we get off my email address. I listened to probably 40 of these every August. Um, I couldn't do it this year because we were in the midst of the playoffs. Uh, Absolutely free for nothing. I don't. uh, It's just one more person's opinion. But uh, and the age range on some of the work that I have sent to me. uh, There's a young man in Cleveland who is nine who wants to be a broadcaster. And so I got on the phone with his father and he uh, uh, and explain uh, I wanted to make sure that his father was OK in any conversations that we had was involved with that and and also was copied on any emails that went back and forth. And the kid's pretty good. I mean, just for a nine year old that's just learning. And a lot of guys that are in the minor leagues now are, are in junior. I am more than happy to do that. I have the time to listen, and I'm glad if you want one opinion that costs nothing, uh, I can share it with you. And I'll tell your producer what the email address is after we get off. If somebody gets in touch with you or somebody you cross paths with in some arena uh, wants that. That's awesome. Uh, I heard Brendan Burke, who calls games uh, for the New York Islanders, say, I've never seen someone as universally loved as Doc. Uh, Now we know why. Doc, this was fun. And... That, that 1960 Fort Wayne Comet squad looks pretty good. 50-16-2, uh, <laughs> and two, 102 points in the regular season. Pretty good team to watch. <laughs> You're all over it. I just <laughs> talked with a member of that team who was one of my two favorite players on the team, Con Madigan, just Tony two days Madigan. ago. Mad Dog Madigan. Yep. yep. He is still going strong out in Portland, Oregon. Con Madigan is, is uh, he is, he's one of my heroes. That's awesome. <laughs> uh, Doc, this was, uh, this was beyond amazing. Uh, let's talk again soon. Enjoy retirement. Enjoy the yeah. dogs. Say hi to the dogs for us. And, yeah, um, I sure will. They and, just had a good run this afternoon in the rain. It's, uh, it's kind of miserable here. But um, um, keep, uh, keep the gentleman on the line there, and I'll be glad to, to uh, give you awesome. that address.
Will Appreciate do. it. Doc, thank you. Congratulations on everything. Okay. Thank you, sir. All right. There is uh, Doc Emmerich.